Hello everyone and welcome to another supplemental. As you know, this is my more loosely scripted show and today we're doing something a little bit different with these. Um, I have a special guest with me, Daniel from Space Doc. Hello, it's me, again. And, exactly, and we're going to talk about uh, something that's a bit more unique, which is how to actually write science fiction. You know, we talk a lot about kind of criticizing science fiction and, and kind of deconstructing stories and stuff ourselves, but um, we have a little bit of experience kind of creating our own sci-fi stories and things. And I thought it'd be quite interesting to talk about kind of creative processes and how if you know someone watching this video wants to get into that kind of thing, uh, perhaps we can impart some kind of useful advice, you know, potentially. So I thought yeah, this could be fun. Yeah. So how did you actually get into writing, you know, fiction in general? Because I'm sure most people watching this will know you as kind of the spaceship guy rather than sort of yeah. the story guy. Uh, the story stuff, uh, to some degree, predates Space Doc. Um, so I, I was, uh, I set up a science fiction society at Glinda University in Wrexham when I was there. And uh, it was around that time that I was experimenting with scripts and, uh, and, and writing this kind of stuff. I, I've wanted to do an audio drama for as long as I can remember. Like, there was just something that I really latched onto when I wanted to do. I think a lot of it was the uh, listening to the audiobook versions of The Expanse with um because they're so well uh read and narrated and also like just expanding on that format because i was i was a huge fan of, of that kind of content i was listening to audiobooks and audio dramas every night really and just wanted to, to make something like that because it's, it's got that perfect balance of like uh celebrating voice acting and also having uh like the capacity to imagine the setting like it still uses that imagination power a bit so I was uh, I was working on a lot of stuff then. Uh, a lot of it was very 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 bad. <laughs> it, was all, uh, it was all like you just just screenplays and stuff written for my own purposes, um, and like the sort of sh like beginnings of ideas that ultimately became things that weren't called the Sojourn but were the Sojourn. Like it's, it's this this project has had fifteen different names and stuff before it eventually came to be what it actually is, and that was yeah that was it. I I did. Um, God, I went all over the place because I, I was doing creative computing at Glinda University, which is basically a course they just made up to uh, to get people to turn up. It was just IT and uh, I wasn't having much fun there. Uh, and Space Doc, I, I started Space Doc while I was there and that started to kick off. And I was hoping that Space Doc would eventually give me a platform to, to write fiction and to like contribute in a more meaningful way to the genre. And uh, as it was starting to pick up, I was like, I should go to another uni and do a film course or something. So that's like, because I was I was in that kind of imposter syndrome stage where oh, you're yeah. like, I don't have any, no, there's no, I don't have a piece of paper telling me I'm allowed to do any of this stuff. What am I doing? <laughs> like, I'm not qualified. So I, I went to do a, a film course in Bangor and I was there for like three weeks. And while I was there, the I did a, a collaboration with Star Wars Explained and Space Doc just exploded and became a full time job and I was like I can't do a course now this is too much work <laughs> so I had to uh, I pull the ejector seat on that and uh, worked on Space Doc for a while and eventually when I wanted to do Sojourn more seriously I I kind of fell into that trap again where I was like uh, I need to do screenwriting courses and I did uh, Open University screenwriting courses two of them. And uh, they are the least useful things I've ever done in the field of, <laughs> of learning about screenwriting. Like, I learned so much more by requesting uh, screenplays from people who made stuff. I got a copy of the screenplay of The Pilot of the Expanse. And I got uh, I dug up a load of old screenplays of, of Wing Commander 4 from various con contacts and stuff. And I just did loads of research and cross-referencing and, and notes and did it all myself. And, like, because you just engage with, with education better that way when it's when it's that kind of thing. Like it's uh, a lot of the time, the uh, courses are, are designed to teach you how to pass a test rather than to teach you how to know about the subject. You know, like it's it's more functional. So uh, yeah, in the end, it was it was mostly that. So I can't, I can't really point to a specific starting point, but it's like it. I guess since my uni days, it's been my objective in the long term. Mm. Yeah, I, I kind of agree that like a lot of kind of sort of unless it's a very expensive, dedicated kind of course, a lot of kind of screenplay courses and things are pretty basic in terms of like this is a narrative structure that is useful and like you know here's sort of how you mm. pitch it and how you do log lines and all that kind of stuff and that's it's why because it's creative always. industries like you can't you can't teach creative industries that way like you can't teach someone how to have an imagination yeah it's, it's sort uh, of like that's like, something that you kind yeah. of develop yourself with just kind of watching things and reading things and kind of as you say kind of hunting for it yourself and kind of mm. kind of trying to reverse engineer it yourself and um 
Although, like, so far, uh, the audience only kind of has the sojourn t- to kind of go off. But when you're kind of coming up with sci-fi stories, because I'm sure you have, you know, likely a drawer full of, like, other ideas and notes and, you know, things and all do, that kind of I stuff. I do, I so, indeed. But when you're coming up with, like, stories... Which kind of like sort of sci-fi do you tend to gravitate towards? Is it kind of like harder sci-fi or sort of more kind of Star Trekky type thing where it's uh, borderline magic? I I gravitate towards hard sci-fi, but I don't write hard sci-fi. I would say the the Sojourn is not hard sci-fi, uh, but it's like it's like skirting towards the edge of it uh, because real hard sci-fi like The Expanse is terrifyingly difficult to write, and it's uh, and like those people do crazy things they have to like they have to remember what kind of gravity every scene is in and like they have astrophysicists as showrunners and stuff and it's just this most the most intimidating like uh thing in the world and and it's also like you have to really know what you're doing because it does become a limitation like a lot of um uh there's the, there's two sides to it really because a lot of a lot of low realism sci-fi gets rid of opportunities for drama and storytelling in the name of simplifying the process with things like artificial gravity and stuff. But, like, that instinct of wanting to simplify it is not entirely wrong because you do need to know your stuff to to write proper hard sci-fi. So uh, I like to to float in that sort of Battlestar Mass Effect kind of place where, um, like, effort is made... Like, we don't go full, like, ludicrous, make up a new kind of particle every week to tell the story, like, the Star Trek kind of stuff. And, uh, and like, I enjoy being able to, to, to use realistic travel times and, uh, and have as few, like, miracle exceptions as possible. Uh, but I, I've, I'm yet to be brave enough to go full expanse in my, in my efforts. But uh, I, I, in the end, it's, like, to me, the most important thing is, is character and, uh, and, and, like, personal storytelling. And, like, the, the, it's, I definitely prefer to write character stories over like event stories and this the setting while i consider it to be massively important is uh like i i i don't want the setting to be the main character and i don't want to completely define myself by realism so that's uh we we get as close as we can uh to be kind of respected for that and appreciated but we don't uh do it to the detriment of of anything else yeah i I feel like battlestar galactica and mass effect are really good examples where it's kind of like the really difficult stuff, as you say, like, you know, gravity and, and all that is kind of taken care of sort of offhandedly, but then it kind of gives you a platform where it's sort of realistic enough that it still feel, it can still be relatable and still be kind of grounded and, and character-driven, as you say. But, yeah, um, Babylon 5 as well, good example yeah, for that. Yeah, that's a really good example as well. But speaking of that, like, do you find it easy or hard to kind of invent new technologies or worlds and and so on and so forth. Is that something which you find really intimidating, or do you think it's like does it just kind of, you know, come out onto the page quite quickly? Hmm. Uh, I don't think any of it's easy, but I do. I do enjoy doing it. It's. Um, I like uh, informing story based on the design of the setting. I think because um, some people who've read in my Patreon blog stuff for Sojourn will know about this, but uh, the idea for the Tantalus cluster came from me looking at. Uh, a photo that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of uh, NGC 1300, which is a barred spiral galaxy. And I was looking at the uh, the trailing edges of its arms and thinking, like, imagine if you were a spacefaring civilization that developed on this, like, island speck in the intergalactic void. Like, how, how much of a nightmare would that be? Like, it's just so staggeringly unlucky. And, that, uh, like, that informed a lot of stuff because, like, I had that idea for a setting that I wanted to tell the story of. And I also had, uh, like, uh, Cass, Croft, Meds, and the Guinevere, all of their backstories and the ship, well, they, they existed as, like, a separate, like, plug-in idea. They didn't have a world. They were just characters with backstories and arcs and foils and a ship. Like, they, they didn't have a world to be plugged into. So I plugged them into the, uh, the, the galaxy setting that I'd separately come up with. And Elizabeth came with the setting, because she's more of a setting-informed character. And that was, like... Uh, so it was, yeah, they came from different places, but it's like I, I enjoy inventing. Uh, I, I enjoy using realistic space environments in unique ways. I think a lot of uh, a lot of sci-fi, it's like asteroid belts and nebula, and that's it. Like there's no there's nothing else in space. Like uh, you never get like pulsars and magnetars and all that interesting stuff. And we're hoping to do more of that in Soja, and a lot of it's all planned because you know space is really really cool. Like it's uh, in as it is is really cool. You don't need to make up nonsense for it. 
and it's uh and it's bigger than it's given credit for in sci-fi like I, I love how the expanse takes full advantage of the actual size of the soul system and the amount of stuff that's in it because you know there's plenty there so we d- we don't invent things unnecessarily if we don't have to and we uh and what we do invent we uh we reincorporate all the time with rather than inventing stuff like for the moment like it's always uh reused so yeah not not necessarily easy but um I enjoy making that kind of stuff. It's 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 a lot of it's it's fun to to bite into. Yeah, I I think um what can be difficult sometimes in kind of creating new sci-fi uh, settings and worlds and technologies and things is the desire to be kind of original. And there's a lot of uh, comparisons where it's sort of like, is it Star Trek type technology or is it this type technology and so on. But what I quite liked about the Sojourn is, as you say, it's it's I think it's quite a unique setting, although it's kind of realistic in that kind of society that's kind of stranded far away from everything else and it kind of organically uh, sort of conjures up more obstacles and more opportunities for storytelling in that way which i quite liked yeah we we, we do try to build up from the uh from just like you come up with the idea the basic idea for the setting and, and a lot of stuff organically springs from that though uh it's like worrying about being compared to things is, is a bad idea like uh you know because you can't he- you can't help it like uh if you're making something that's that's close to hard sci-fi, you're then worrying about being compared to other things that are also close to hard sci-fi, which is just worrying about being compared to the real world, <laughs> which you know, like that's just like, that way lies madness. So you know, this it's you can't really help it. Like, there's only so many uh, types of space opera. There's only so many like gradients of technology, and uh, you know, if you go out of your way to be completely, totally original and out, madly out of left field. You're just going to make something incomprehensibly insane. So it's like you, you know, you've got it. You've got it. The tropes are just as are just as valuable as anything else used in moderation. I always feel like sort of tropes of a science fiction setting or tropes in general are like are like a good starting place. Where even though it kind of may seem really cliche and the wrong thing to do, it's like I think it's wise to treat that stuff as a foundation, which you can then kind of build on top of and and take new places and kind of subvert. Uh, and so on and and you know be kind of creative that way whereas as opposed to trying to sort of say no we're not going remotely near a cl- that cliche or that archetype or that trope mm. it's actually like they can be actually be val- valuable tools in creating something at the same time yeah it helps uh, draw general science fiction fans into new sci-fi ips because they have some like solid ground to stand on with things they're familiar with. I think it's why people have such a hard time getting into like Farscape because it's completely yeah. batshit insane. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's like <laughs> del- deliberately as like aggressively weird as humanly possible. So it's, it's, it's even like, even I had a hard time getting into it at first because like, it's just, it, it's just like so alien yeah. and that can be a problem. Although like Farscape as weird as, as it is sometimes, it's, it's got nothing on Lex. Like, <laughs> like I've, Oh no, I've made... only you have been brave enough to stray there. <laughs> yeah, I've made two videos on Lex and like every conclusion that I've come to i've just got loads of angry comments because they're like you just don't get it and i'm like yeah, i don't know what i'm supposed to get here <laughs> i'm it's, leaving that to you yeah. there but for the grace of god go i <laughs> it is the most bizarre thing <laughs> but uh you know speaking of like loads of other kind of examples and things who would you say are your kind of biggest creative inspirations whether it be writers or directors or you know storytellers in general who do you kind of cite as like your your biggest kind of influences Hmm. Uh, well, I mean, recently, uh, broadly speaking, as in like post two thousand and eleven, it's got to be uh, the Expanse as a as a big as a big reference. But I really latch on to basically everything that Ronald D. Moore has done when in TV sci fi. TV sci fi is my main base. I've I've always uh, enjoyed long form storytelling more than movies. Like uh, books, video games, and TV shows are are uh, significantly more likely to get me properly emotional than uh, than a film because there's just enough time for it you know like uh, if you want to make space doc cry you need like the the finale of avatar the last airbender or uh, or like uh, galactica breaking her back at the end of the show like you, you need you need all that build up i need, I need that big uh, that big long stretch of familiarity uh, and i can ne- i can never quite get there with movie trilogies or just movies and stuff so i i take a lot like i mean I've, i naturally you're going to uh, you're going to try and emulate the things that get the most emotion out of you. So uh, a lot, of, a lot of my base references are uh, a sci-fi TV, of which I think Ronald D. Moore was like the king for a long time. Like uh, it's Deep Space Nine and Battlestar Galactica are just great. Like they're just like realist 
realist sci-fi in in a and in a really like well executed way, and it's uh, a a great subversion of what TV sci-fi was at the time. Like Deep Space Nine is a, is a subversion of Star Trek. It's a realist's take on an optimist's story, and then Battlestar Galactica is a realist's take on like it's like the end of the polystyrene of the plasticine forehead sci-fi yeah, yeah. world you know <laughs> like it's uh it's we're just going to take this seriously and we're going to shock all of the people like andromeda was on the other channel yeah. when that was coming out <laughs> andromeda like come on <laughs> you know yeah. that's where it was at it's so that really brilliant. was like a defibrillator to the chest of science fiction. In terms of kind of writing, writing as you say, with like long form storytelling is, is your your kind of jam. Do you like have? Do you choose to map everything out beforehand, or do you kind of like to discover it as you're writing, or is that do you have kind of an in between that you do? Uh, yeah, I don't completely embrace either of those philosophies, but I gravitate towards the planning more. Uh, you, you, I think you must have a plan, basically. Like, uh, don't completely freestyle, cause, uh, cause that's like that's how you end up with, uh, like writing yourself out of a corner and getting a bad ending, basically. And you need to, you need to have a good ending. So, but I also like, I'm aware that I will get better and have better ideas as I'm making it, and I don't want to be a slave to the plan. Like later on, like I don't want to be, I don't want to be unable to incorporate better stuff that I've come up with later down the line as a more experienced writer. Uh, because I'm sticking to the plan, and also I want to be able to react to what becomes fan favorite characters and fan favorite plot arcs and stuff, and expand on them. So generally, uh, like we have Sojourn planned out in broad detail for three seasons. We know uh, we know where all the characters are ending. We know what uh, what where the plot is ending and where the the main milestones on the route to it are. Uh, but I'm like I, I'm set up in such a way that I can be malleable in the in the intermediary space and uh and tell good stories as they come to mind and uh, and things that that writers we work with come up with and things that the audience latches onto but yeah closer closer to plan than no plan but not entirely uh writing i think it's the architect's approach as george rr R. martin called it yeah yeah i think i remember reading somewhere that um ronald d e. moore and david ike when it came to battlestar galactica they say the most they planned in detail was like 10 episodes ahead so rather than kind of having like the all the big arcs, you know, mapped out from the very beginning, they were like, we've got the next ten episodes planned out, and then they kind of went from there. I think the idea of having like a detailed plan for like long form storytelling can make is maybe a little a bit a bit overrated. I find like people kind of latch onto that idea, and I think like a lot of people talk about you know Babylon Five with J. Michael Straczynski, where he had his five year plan kind of already written out, but at the same time. J. Michael Straczynski also had ways of kind of improvising and changing and, and diverting the story in different directions if need be. You know, he had like a trap door for every single character where if for whatever reason, you know, a cast member couldn't return or, or had to go or whatever, he had a way of like kind of getting them out the way. And he had like, you know, major alterations to season four that still worked. And I think mm. I, I really like um, the metaphor that Nicholas Meyer once used, the uh, writer director of The Wrath of Khan, where he likened it to um, a road trip where he said, I know where I'm starting and I know where I'm finishing, but the only um, the, the only amount I've planned ahead in detail is how much of the road my headlights will illuminate. Mm -hmm. And I that's think that's qu it's quite yeah. a good metaphor where it's kind of like you can plan it out and you can know where you're going to go, but there's a strength in kind of being good at improvisation, you know, because a lot of people point yeah. to, like, the Marvel Cinematic Universe as well. And people think that was, like, all planned out in painstaking detail. Oh, it wasn't no, really. It wasn't. No, it was, they were just very good at improvising. You know, they're like, yeah. okay, no one likes, you know, the Hulk movies that much. Well, then it'll just be a supporting character and so-and-so, you know. and it's To be fair, so, so is Battlestar. Like, Battlestar mm. is a masterful impression of being planned out, yeah. you know. Like, you get to the end of Battlestar and you're like, oh, my God, that was so carefully planned and it wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, it just convinces you really well yeah. that it was. So, like, if you if you're careful, you can you can make that work. Yeah, I think, and I, I suppose Straczynski would have actually had to use his trapdoor for Talia Winters. Yeah, for did get rid yeah of for Talia, and he yeah. had to use it for Sinclair as well, obviously. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, and he yeah, as I said, he reorganized all of like season four as well because he thought it was going to end at season four and didn't know he was going to get the fifth season at the time. Yeah, that was that was very unfortunate timing. Yeah, it was. <laughs> but um, um, I think uh, another kind of good. Uh, 
I had a really good example. Another one. <laughs> another good, oh, oh yeah, my sorry. god! I'm sorry. I blew straight yeah. through that. <laughs> another another good example. I think of co- sort of the opposite is uh, the reason I'm not as big a fan of Stargate SG One as I am Stargate Atlantis, and I feel like if you're kind of beholden to a plan or if you know you kind of fight that urge to kind of take a story in a natural direction you get what happens in stargate sg1 sometimes where like they kill off major villains in really good episodes in really good ways but then that villain like shows up again the next season and they keep finding ways to kind of hit the reset button a little bit where um because who's the first guy apophis like he dies at the beginning of season two and then he's back again and then he dies again and they do the same thing with anubis where they kill him off in that really great two-part that sets up stargate atlantis but then he comes back the next season and he's all like regenerating and things it's kind of like it just feels a bit redundant, you know, where it's kind of like... The, the the second incarnation of Anubis is so forgettable. Oh, yeah. Like, like it was so well done, and he was and it was such a great conclusion. And then it's like, he's just in someone's body or something, and it's like a two-episode thing, and then they flush him into space. And it's so cheap. Yeah. Like, he gets turned into, like, a problem of the week thing later. And it's like, yeah, you know, yeah. just leave him dead. It's bizarre, yeah. So I, I, I kind of have a general rule of thumb of, like improvising is is good and kind of having a looser plan works if you commit to kind of the decisions you've made where it's like let's not contort this to try and make it something that it's not you know if it's going in this direction follow it and capitalize on it and kind of see how interesting you can make it see how great a story you can make out out of that avenue yeah and that way like uh you lose the chance of it ever looking like you planned it all out like there's a you know whether or not you actually did plan it all out is less less important than whether or not it seems like you did because if you uh, if you if you start re- uh, like paving over stuff you've already published that's when people are like these guys have no plan at all what is um your kind of this is a very vague question i've just realized in the in the notes but what is your approach to kind of creating characters you know where does where does the the inspiration come from from that or do you have a kind of method in terms of you know this is how i build this person i think People say like writing is always a self portrait, and the uh, like the main characters of Sojourn are definitely all aspects of myself. Like even even not deliberately doing that, it's uh, it's like it just happens. I think uh, there's a lot of Brexit in Meds. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, like angry expatriate yeah. is uh, you know like you can't you can't really help that. And like Croft is the is the space doc. Yeah. <laughs> you know he's like Mister <laughs> Space Doc. Like it kind of happens, but also like I think. It's another kind of organic thing. Like you come up with a idea for like a backstory and an upbringing and a, and a series of events that would make an interesting protagonist, and then you think like who would be an interesting foil to this, and like who would be an interesting foil to them, and what would like what's like it sort of spreads from there. You know, you I mean when this is going out, you guys don't actually have a lot of backstory for these characters yet, but I had those ideas in mind, and I was like, it would be a, a good idea to have. A character who is um, like was there in like the uh, the days of the of the war where a lot of this backstory happened to be the kind of soul tie to their Adama, and that's what Meds was. And then uh, you get the I, I kind of like uh, uh, Croft is is an example of um, like me standing up for the idea that not every character has to be like a Shakespearean grandiose like. Greek Greek tragedy thing like uh, it's like uh, Croft has a lot in common with Alex from the Expanse, where he's um, like they have a lot of depth and they serve the other characters quite well and they're they're likable, but like the story can't be about everyone, you know, like uh, it just becomes like uh, incomprehensible soup if you do it that way. So it's I, I I like the idea that Croft has basically finished his arc before the story starts. Like, um, he's a guy who was, like, he was looking to find his place where he belonged, and he has done, and now he's there, and we've just left the cameras rolling, kind of thing. Like, because, uh, you know, the, like, that's the way it is. You don't always meet people who are in the middle of their hero's journey. Sometimes you have people in your life who are quite content where they are. So it seems a, it seems a reasonable approach. Mm. I, th- yeah. I think that is a valuable thing of, like, always thinking about, like, well, what was this, like, this person's life like before this story and you know how might it go afterwards i think like that goes a long way in kind of making them feel like they're real people rather than just sort of props or tools to further the plot 
you know yeah. and um but i think something which is important as well which like sometimes like i've certainly struggled with and sometimes you know writers can kind of trip up with is like writing backstories great but personality is like so so important as well where mm. i've always heard the kind of uh, the idea of um what would it be like to sit down and have a drink with this character and it's kind of like if you can you know figure out what they would talk about and figure out how they would react to certain topics then you're do then you've you've got some really good kind of material there um that you can kind of use to propel a scene that that character is driving or in or when they're interacting with other characters and so on i think it was i can't remember where i saw this i think it was on like a, a charlie brooker screen wipe special when he was just talking about writers it was a really good episode i think it's on youtube right. and um he was talking to paul abbott i think who said that um, every character that you write should be about three people you know composited mm. into one person. And I think that's quite interesting in terms of, like, you know, taking person different kind of personality traits and, you know, finding that inspiration in real life or in other fiction and kind of mixing and mashing, you know, sort of like backstories and personalities and other traits and things. And that can kind of help you develop sort of characters which do feel more organic and more three-dimensional than just sort of, you know, the two-dimensional kind of, this is the device that furthers the plot kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and sort of tangentially related to characters is, how what is your approach to writing dialogue? Again, it's a vague question, but, you know, dialogue I feel like is a thing which a lot of aspiring writers kind of really want to get right. Um, do you ever find, like, writing dialogue difficult? I, uh, I'm going to have to be staggering the unhelpful here in, in saying that dialogue is something that comes quite naturally to me. And, uh, like, I don't know why, you know, like it's, uh, like, I think I write Sojourn in a very kind of Firefly, Joss Whedon sort of way. Like, uh, like, and I, I really love it. I, I love writing that stuff. Like, um, uh, one of my favorite scenes to write was the, uh, just the bar scene in episode three where they're just, they're just hanging out. Cause like, if, if, uh, if nobody came in to like, force me to actually write a story i would just write about these people in the pub for like three seasons you know because there's just like so much the, the their personalities are designed to like mesh and create great banter and, and all that and uh like it, it is like i would just mind that forever if i wasn't having to also tell a story so yeah it's like i don't know like we've all got uh we've, we've all got those witty retorts that we would say if people would just be gracious enough to frame the conversation around them, you know? And when you're a writer, you can. When you're a writer, you can have people say things that are just setups for somebody to say something greater, you know? Like, uh, and, and you, you get to, like, live out all of the, uh, all of the impossibly uh, sharp-witted and fun conversations that you're imagining. And that's why uh, Elizabeth is my favorite character to write for in The Sojourn. Because... Uh, a lot of her inspiration comes from uh, Jadzia Dax in Deep Space Nine because I love the fact that she, that character is like she's lived for 600 and something years and it hasn't turned her into this like Spock-esque wild, uh, like like uh, wise owl kind of character. She's not like this stoic, she's just a party animal like, uh, like, she's, like she's lost all like what's the point, doesn't matter, let's just party all the time because nothing, nothing matters you know, that's what, that's what happens when you live that long yeah and I like the idea of having. Uh, well, first of all, it's a it's a subversion of like the lazy trope of scientists. Like, uh, like she's not this uh, this like reclusive social square. She's like she's like this full on uh, like extroverted social person. And um, and also, it's just the ultimate foil for our very kind of socially uh, like inexperienced protagonist. Who uh, who is now having to work with somebody who has like been put in charge of the most important high stakes dangerous thing imaginable and uh and doesn't fit any of the of uh, doesn't tick any of the boxes of what she sees as like leadership material like um because the, to somebody who has had a military and aristocratic upbringing uh to be like here's the person in charge of your of the 60,000 man expedition to save us all and they're uh, and they're just like in the pub you know like uh, and and smoke smoking on duty and like larking about and stuff, and and we slowly reveal, uh, or we we slowly have Cass learn that her uh, that her uh, way of running things and her um, camaraderie with her crew is a perfectly legitimate approach, if not a particularly military one. But it's like it inspires a lot of love from the people working for her, and uh, and and seeing things that other way uh, is is an interesting experience for Cass. 
So that's like another example of like just just using the foil yeah. to create interesting, it's kind, that, interesting that, dialogue. That, and that kind of reminds me of um, the Aubrey Matron relationship in Master and Commander. How uh, uh, Aubrey's, as we said in the last supplemental, it was like Aubrey's very much you know kind of conservative and disciplined and very militaristic, whereas Matron's a bit more kind of you know uh, sort of wants to be on kind of equal footing and, and understanding and things of, of the crew on that ship and things but uh yeah you know. you're absolutely right and like ideally neither of them should should start with a world view that is entirely correct like the ideal should be somewhere between them so they can learn from each other and and, and individually become better as a result exactly yeah yeah i uh I'm uh, very jealous, actually, now that you've said that you find dialogue really easy, because for me in particular, I, it's one of the things I find I, I struggle with quite a lot. Um, uh, it's mostly when you end up writing characters who are not really like you as a writer. Um, and it's like, because uh, an example uh, I was thinking of earlier were uh, in paragon my book and things i wrote this character who's supposed to be very sort of charming and and witty and kind of you know very outgoing and and sort of boisterous and things like that and that's just not me at all and it's like when mm. <laughs> when you're not that charming and you're not that witty and you're not that funny how do you write <laughs> someone who's really charming and witty and funny and like so that's kind of a, a thing which i sometimes struggle with in dialogue and kind of that takes me a lot of work to really get right and um there's definitely a lot of like re like re using references and stuff is always a good idea like um whenever i've had to write like manipulative narcissistic characters like that's when you look to history and you look to uh to like documentaries about cults and stuff like that and uh, people with those kind of infectious uh sinister personalities uh like a, a lot of it you can like with some effort uh sort of wing and, and like based on assumption uh, and, and like the kind of things that you expect would would uh, influence people like that but you know research never hurts like just just it's it's always worth doing piles of research for anything really yeah like yeah it's good to kind of like as, as we said to sort of draw from kind of real life sources and things and the weirdest source I got you know uh, a sort of another piece of advice if you want to call it this is kind of just sort of be on the lookout for kind of sources of inspiration in your real life because how you know the character that, that I mentioned in uh, Paragon ended up kind of being written the way he is is that it, it was a friend of mine doing an impression of his dad <laughs> who was very much right. the kind of person that I was that that character was was supposed to be, and it was kind of like you know because he'd do that impression uh, quite a bit, and you know because you know because it's sort of like funny and he's good at it and all that kind of stuff, and it was just sort of like you know a couple of nights at the pub and like hearing him do that and that voice and things, and I'm like that's totally that kind of person, and yeah. then it's sort of like that's awesome. one, once the, once I heard it more, I'm kind of like I think I, I sort of get into the headspace of you know what that what that character would sound like and how that dialogue kind of came to be so it was the weirdest inspiration but it really worked it does it does come from weird places when it happens but you know yeah. if it works it works it's like shower thoughts it'll just it come to you in, in like the weirdest oh, weirdest moments it always is i'm telling you like two-thirds of the sojourn has has uh has come into my mind while like in the shop or in like tesco or whatever like it's just like when you're doing other stuff you know, it's, and you, like you can bang your head against the wall for hours and achieve nothing, and then you go outside for five minutes and just realize it all. Absolutely, yeah. That's why, like, um, I'm assuming like the sort of the notes app on your phone is just full of stuff, because <laughs> because oh, I I, uh, I send Facebook messages to myself. Oh, right. You can you yeah. can do that. So I have a big massive chain of messages to myself. Yeah, about stuff. Because like I do, I do stuff like that where I'm like on a bus or walking around and things as you say, and then I get an idea and I'm like, oh, this is good. Now I just have to like write it, scribble it down really really quickly in my notes. And then by the time I get home, it's all shorthanded. It doesn't make any sense. And I have to really think it all again. Yep, yep, the, absolutely. the most annoying one, actually, was uh, recently when I started writing uh, my new book, um, the first chapter of that literally just materialized itself into my mind when I was trying to go to sleep. <laughs> I was, it was like... Two, oh, it's always that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was like, it's always that. It was like two or three in the morning. And I was like trying to... I was like half asleep. And then just like the, the words just kind of like showed up in my brain and I was like this is actually pretty good and then I was like well I can't if I just you know if I sleep I'll forget all of this by, t by the morning so I had to get up and just start frantically writing it all down on my computer it was yeah. kind of like the first episode of Torchwood um, when Gwen has to write yeah. all that stuff down you know, before the before she gets yeah with the retcon pills yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah it, it does come to you in, the, in like the weirdest times 
And um, yeah, it's unhelpful. Yeah. <laughs> In terms of story as well, do you find it easier to write kind of smaller scale stories or larger scale story? Because I know some people who kind of, you know, they they have something that's sort of like. Uh, Babel, uh, like a Babylon 5 you know something that's like really big in scale like a space opera you know or like a Lord of the Rings where it's again just like this big epic thing and they find that really intimidating and there's other people who kind of you know they're given a story of like it's two people in a room and they find that really difficult to write what mm. do you kind of find is, is sort of like your comfort zone in terms of the scale of a story uh, I'd say it's my assessment that a large epic story should be a small personal story like uh, like you know this the the uh, Tell, you can tell a plot of any size through the lens of character stories of any size, basically. And I, uh, I, I'd i say, not only do I find it easier, but I find it more fulfilling to write uh, small personal stories. But, like, obviously the Sojourn is pretty is pretty large in scope. But it's, um, it's deliberately told through as few people as possible. And uh, it's, like... And it's their decisions. Like, we have the... Like, it's, it's, it's uh, in the opening monologue... The um that it'll fall on the on the choices of very few, you know. That's the uh, that's the whole the whole thing there. And I remember uh, uh, the original Guinevere crew of Cass, Croft, and Meds. I wanted I was I, I was impressed by uh, Killjoys and how they have a three character main cast. And I was like, just refine it, just just as few, just just refine it all the way down. Because that uh, uh, what else does it well? Uh, Harry Potter, the uh, Ron, Hermione, and Harry. Like three is a good number for uh, for main crews. Do you not need superfluous characters? And uh, refining it all down to that, like you can you can tell a, a, a fulfilling story about the, their own personal lives, and it's easier to latch onto that kind of thing. It's why people love Firefly so much and everything, because it's just people keeping the lights on and living. And uh, one one thing that that I do uh, make a, a major point of in Sojourn is like the the it's a small personal story that is now unwittingly stuck in a large story because the, the crew of Guinevere don't want to be there they uh, like they are literally just working to keep the lights on they're just doing their job and like this galaxy saving food expedition was like the best paying job available at the time and they signed on for it and they got stuck there and then one of them ended up in charge of it or they're almost in charge of it because uh because it just went like uh it all went horribly wrong and they were the only people available and even like now i suppose from the from the people listening to this video's uh, perspective they still want to just go home like uh you know this is uh the world's problems are not necessarily their problems they can relate to them but uh like uh, it's it's uh it's their own lives that matters the most to them. And I think, um, like, people concern themselves with with not uh, wanting to advocate for selfishness in stories. Like, we have, uh, like, heroes are defined by selflessness so often. And that's not how humans work, you know? Like, it's not a, it's not necessarily, uh, it, it's, it's not a bad thing to, uh, to make your life about the well-being of yourself and the people you love you know and it's it's why uh it's why malcolm reynolds is such a compelling character in firefly because um like he has all of his problems with simon and everything and he wants to uh like he he, he would be better for everyone if he could just drop them off because they're a, like a target on his back and and then he'll rescue them and, and they'll they'll ask why and he'll say it's because you're on my crew like it's just that like his crew is himself like he uh and he doesn't care about the alliance anymore. He doesn't care about any of it. Like, uh, and he's lost his faith. He's lost his religion, and uh, and he's not trying to uh, until he eventually does the whole aim to misbehave thing. He's uh, it takes it takes that to finally get him to turn around and stand up to, for himself again. But in the time up until then, uh, he's just staying one step ahead of them and keeping the lights on because because that's like that's so much more relatable. You know, that's our lives. That's the people. The people listening to this stuff can relate to that. We're not all uh, trying to save the world. We're just trying to pay pay the bills, you know, and uh, and I, I like telling that stuff because those small, uh, reachable goals are things that we can relate to, and uh, and I like the idea of, of with the sojourn being able to tell a large epic story through the lens of people who just want to go back to their small personal story. Yeah. yeah. Well, even though uh, I know you're you're very much kind of an advocate of like we need more original sci-fi and things like that, and I totally agree with that, but. Uh, one of the questions I got here is if you could sort of if you could write for any established IP sci-fi or otherwise uh, what would it be if you got the call would you what what one would you be like yes to there's there is no existing IP that I would find more fulfilling to work on than writing original stuff 
But uh, but if I did have an opportunity, I, I, as I said, I, I don't th- I wouldn't I wouldn't be brave enough to work on Expanse because I'd be uh, I'd be wor- worried about ruining my favorite thing by not be, not knowing what I'm doing. But the uh, I guess Mass Effect is a is a, a world I'd like to write in because that's just a really well crafted world, and it's uh, like that Mass Effect was never afraid to like it's like boldly uh, adapting bits of Babylon Five and stuff, and it's like uh, it's it's just celebrating existing sci fi. But it's just it's still quite unique and it's a really it's a really well made setting and it has a lot of potential. I like Battlestar as well, but also um Battlestar ties itself up really nicely in the, the two thousand and four one. And I'm a big advocate of uh sci fi stories, any stories really, should uh say their piece, pref- preferably not take too long to say it, and then gracefully bugger off basically. <laughs> yeah. Like and al- allow the uh, allow their story to be remembered for what it is and not uh and not saturate themselves with like piles upon piles of uh, of extra content, so uh, I w- I wouldn't want to be inadvertently contributing to that with Battlestar, but yeah, Mass Effect I think I think Mass Effect is still in its prime as a as a IP and it has tons of potential and a great setting and there's a lot of interesting things to explore there. Yeah, I'd absolutely agree with that. Yeah, um, any parting advice before uh, we sort of wrap things up? Don't call yourself an aspiring writer if you're a, if you're writing you're a writer. And there's no, there's no, uh, there's no use for any of that self-deprecation, because uh, you're gonna, you're gonna end up in that kind of imposter syndrome place anyway. And there's no, like, you, you're not mitigating that by by saying things like that. Like, uh, doesn't matter how many people read your stuff or whether you're published or anything. Uh, you know, I, I like, it's, it's a sort of dress for the job you want situation. Like, if 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 that's what you want to, if you want to frame yourself as a writer, do so, uh, because. Like if that's if that's what you call yourself, then that's what people will see you as, and it'll probably help you get noticed more. So uh, yeah, there's no point to one by by uh, modestly referring to yourself as aspiring in anything. I think uh, there's something to be said to just going for it, and also um, don't worry too much about nagging people. It is it is a bit of a a bit of a ladder of contacts, the whole creative industries world, and uh, like I'm very glad that I managed to get copies of screenplays from people I respected to study myself by bothering them about it and uh, like I would never have been able to work on Force Recon with Expanse if I hadn't relentlessly bothered people about it and uh, you know you have to be a bit remorseless in that sense especially I think British people were all kind of uh, were all kind of conditioned for like don't bother people be polite and all this but in a, in a kind of brutalist sense these authors and, and uh, high up creative figures that you respect for your purposes, they are only useful if you can take advantage of them. You know, like, uh, it's just a contact in a list. And if uh, if you worry about pissing them off or bothering them, then, like, like if, if you've bothered them, you're career-wise exactly where you were before, it doesn't matter, you know? Like, uh, a person who was never going to help you, uh, who is now annoyed, is, is functionally identical to a person who was never going to help you, who isn't annoyed. So you might as well risk it, you know, like, uh, and, and these people have busy lives and they're not going to, they're almost certainly not going to be as bothered as you think they will be by, uh, by asking them. So yeah, just, uh, just put, push the envelope a little bit and, uh, and have a little bit of like, st- you know, stand up straight and, and, and kind of believe yourself to be a little bit better than you might believe yourself to be. And, uh, and, and, and you might be, you might be able to just keep building on that and going, because uh, you don't want that spiral of kind of self-destructive yeah. thought. It, hel- it helps to have a little bit of an ego, uh, be, being able yeah, to kind of okay. say, no, I am good at this. You know, it helps to be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. Not too much of one, but definitely not too little. Exactly. Either. Yeah. I think that's really good advice. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I think, I hope that was interesting <laughs> to to the viewers and things. Uh, I certainly, uh, yeah, I, I certainly did. Um, but um, so hopefully, will the Sojourn Volume Two be out by the time this goes out? Or, or... oh god, no, no, <laughs> <laughs> it'll be uh, uh, no, uh, maybe like uh, what are we hoping for? We're hoping for like I guess before summer twenty twenty one. So uh, yeah, hopefully you'll you'll certainly be getting a lot of. Uh, a lot of information soon mm. but uh yeah we got a small team and these are su- super high production and they take a long time to make yeah but yeah i can promise you that it will be great we've, we've put a, we've put a lot of work into it and we've got some really awesome uh guest stars and i think people are gonna love yeah. it well, I'm, I'm, and check out volume one if you haven't already exactly yeah I, well i'm very much looking forward to it and uh, volume one is on you know every platform now isn't it it's like audible and google books and whatever yeah you know. Aud- audible google books uh scribed 
Best place to get it is uh, Patreon. You can get it slightly cheaper than the other places and a larger percentage of it goes to the supporting the pro- project. And also uh, you can, if you if you go, uh, I think it's Wayfarer tier, no, uh, Wanderer tier, you can get the Visual Dictionary, which we put together. It's based on the old Star Wars style Visual Dictionaries. And uh, I, I, when I finished making that, I was like, am I more proud of this than I am of the actual show? <laughs> I was so pleased with that thing. So yeah, please go, please go read my nerdy law book. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, sounds great. Well, um, thank you very much again for joining me, and um, links for the Sojourn and whatever and, and Space Dark Channel will be all over the place. Um, I hope uh, you enjoyed listening to us ramble about uh, writing things, and um, yes. as always, have a good one and live long and prosper. Thank you for watching. If you like these videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my patrons or my YouTube members where you can see videos early as well as some other exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.